It's my privilege to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of the new Northeastern University Health Policy and Law Program. This program has been a while in the making and is built off extraordinary faculty both in the law school and in other colleges at the university and now increasingly interdisciplinary faculty um, including Kristen Madison who joined us this year and has a uh, joint appointment between the law school and the Bouvet College of Health Sciences and more of those people will be coming. We feel that health issues touch almost all of the fields in which we work and that they are core not only to um, issues issues that have to do with current law, but also thinking about human rights more broadly. This lecture, and I'll turn this over to Wendy and Parmet in a minute, um, is part of a series of activities that we're going to have this year and that we will be building over time. So I hope that you'll all follow what we do in this area, and I think that um, the exciting ha faculty that we have here, led by Wendy Parmet, will really be turning this into a tremendous place of thinking around how to address health issues in the coming years. So, Wendy. Thank you, and welcome to our inaugural lecture. And before I forget, there will be a reception um, immediately afterwards, so don't completely fill up on pizza because there's more food to come. Um, when I think about the potential speakers we could have had today. I, I can't imagine a speaker who I am just more thrilled and honored to have and is more, and who would be more appropriate as our inaugural speaker than Professor Sylvia Law. She's the Elizabeth K. Dollar Professor of Law, Medicine, and Psychiatry at New York University School of Law. She's been a visiting professor of law at numerous law schools, including Harvard, Stanford, the University of Hawaii, and many others. I won't name them all. She's the recipient of numerous awards and accolades, including um, the prestigious MacArthur Genius Fellowship. She's published many books and articles on health law, reproductive rights, women's rights, constitutional law, tort law, other subjects. For me, I'm going to go through the CV, you can see it all. There are two aspects of her career that really stand out and I think make her the perfect speaker for today. One, she has really been a leader in moving the field of health law, which I think was, I hope no one takes offense at this, once a rather stodgy field, we used to call it legal medicine, uh, focusing a lot on forensic medicine and some medical malpractice, but she really helped to move it and make it become a dynamic field that integrated health, law with policy, which of course is what our program is all about, and one that focused with and put it central to the questions of health law, issues about access, Dis, what we now call disparities, quality of care, and cost. And she really helped to turn the tide so that these questions, which are so central to what we think of as important today, were the central, central core and mission of health law. And second, while being a leading careful, brilliant, innovative scholar, she has also always been an activist. And an, so her scholarship has always been engaged. She was counsel in some of the most important reproductive rights cases that have been before the New York, uh, the US Supreme Court, including Harris versus McRae, and has written amicus briefs, very important and influential amicus briefs in many other reproductive rights and health law cases including Planned Parenthood versus Casey, Glucksburg, and I can go on. In short, um, she has achieved in her career, I think, um, what our program hopes to, what, what we aspire to try to achieve. Um, interdisciplinary, engaged scholarship in the name 
all aimed at improving public health and access and quality. So I'm just absolutely thrilled that she will be speaking to us on taxpayer conscience and health reform. She'll be taking questions after her talk. Thank you. Well, thank you for that wonderfully generous introduction. I am completely delighted to be here. I wish NYU is a big school. We have nothing like this. I wish we had something like this, that you guys are so fortunate to have such a wonderful faculty and, and an emphasis on these important issues. The students I met today were fabulous. Um, so um, my title, Taxpayer Conscience and Health Reform, uh, arose because as I'm studying the developments in healthcare reform, I noticed that there's this rhetorical theme about the consciousness of the taxpayer. Uh, and that's the theme I want to address. Uh, the new concepts advanced under the banner of taxpayer consciousness assert that public spending, pub tax expenditures, tax deductions, or even private insurance payments may not subsidize services that offend the consciousness of taxpayers uh, or insurance payers. The cl claim of taxpayer consciousness further asserts that public funds can be denied to otherwise qualified people and programs uh, if they engage in actions unrelated to the funded activity that violate the consciousness of some payers. Um, I will argue that taxpayer consciousness is a concept that's dangerous to democracy, uh, but first the idea needs to be placed in a couple of contexts. If you search the term taxpayer consciousness or the conscientious taxpayer on Google, you'll find dozens of pages and virtually all of the first hundred links address one subject and only one. Can you figure out what that is? <laughs> abortion. <laughs> abortion. Uh, the, conscious of the consciousness of the taxpayer, the conscience of the taxpayer is, it seems, very narrowly focused. Uh, there's no discussion about taxpayers who conscientiously believe that the death penalty is state-sanctioned murder, uh, or taxpayers who uh, object to the detention of people without due process or access to habeas corpus. The newly popular concept of taxpayer conscious, conscientious objection to abortion takes place against a 40-year background of systematically excluding from otherwise comprehensive federal health programs uh, one service, and that's abortion. When the Supreme Court transformed abortion from a crime to a right in Roe v. Wade in 1973, state Medicaid programs and private insurance programs covered abortion. Abortion is a medically necessary procedure. Uh, it's a surgical procedure. It's performed by physicians. That is the heart of what insurance typically covers. Uh, procedures, surgery, doctors. But in 1976, Congress passed the Hyde Amendment prohibiting federal funding for abortions, um, except where the life uh, of the mother would be endangered if the fetus were carried to term. Congress has since extended the ban on federal funding for abortion to other groups of women. For example, women serving in the military cannot obtain a federally funded abortion even when the pregnancy results from rape or incest. Military doctors and healthcare facilities cannot provide abortions even when the woman is willing to pay out of her own pocket. Uh, women are not automatically entitled to a leave so that they could pay their own expense to go to Europe or someplace where they could get an abortion. Federal funds for abortion are denied to Native Americans and they can't pay for abortions at the only facilities available in isolated areas. Abortions excluded from funding for health insurance for federal employees, for disabled women eligible for Medicare, for teens covered by the state child health insurance program, 
Federal prisoners are denied access to abortion. The District of Columbia, unlike the states, is not allowed to use its own local funds to pay for abortions. Peace Corps volunteers are denied access to abortion even if the pregnancy threatens the life of the woman. Uh, these restrictions have been challenged unsuccessfully by women with life-threatening pregnancy and by wim women carrying fetuses that were unlikely to survive after birth. Well, you might ask, given this comprehensive, long-established regime uh, denying federal funding for abortion, even in very extreme circumstances, what concretely concerns the conscientious federal taxpayer? Uh, right now, many bills are pending in the U.S. Congress to protect the conscience of taxpayers who oppose abortion. The No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion Act would impose new taxes on employer-provided uh, health insurance benefits if the employer sponsor uh, covers abortion, uh, which most now do. The Taxpayer Conscious Protection Act would force states at state expense to post uh, detailed data on every abortion funded at state expense on a publicly accessible uh, internet site. The Taxpayer Freedom of Conscience Act of 2011 uh, would prevent federal expenditures on any form of family planning, foreign or domestic. But that goes a little beyond abortion. Uh, all of these bills have passed the House uh, by very wide margins and are in committee in the Senate. A variant on the claim of taxpayer consciousness, uh, conscientious taxpayer, uh, asserts that pu public funds can be denied to people and to programs who do important federally funded work. Uh, this idea was presented most dramatically in this fall's debate on raising the U.S. debt ceiling. As the world watched, appreciating that the United States sovereignty is a matter of deep importance for the fragile economy of the planet, uh, in the midst of that debate, the House devoted three hours of floor time to defunding Planned Parenthood. Uh, Mike Pence of Indiana proposed an amendment to bar Planned Parenthood from receiving any federal funds. Uh, in communities around the nation, Planned Parenthood is a primary source of care for contraception, prevention of sexually transmitted disease, cancer screening, uh, and often the only source of primary health care available to low-income men and women. Um, Planned Parenthood has long lived with vigorously enforced federal rules pertaining uh, prohibiting federal funding for abortion or abortion referrals. Um, but Planned Parenthood depends on federal funding uh, for the basic health care services that it provides. Pence asserted, quote, it's morally wrong to take taxpayer dollars, millions of pro-life Americans, and use them to subsidize the largest abortion provider in America. Thanks to the leadership of the Speaker of the House, John Boehner, the American people will be able to see who stands with the taxpayers and who stands with big abortion. Um, John Kyle, Republican of Arizona, asserted that abortion is over 90% of what Planned Parenthood does. Now, in fact, abortions account for less than 3% of the services provided by Planned Parenthood, and none are funded with federal money. So far, those proposals have been rejected in the Senate. However, this year, six states have prohibited state fundings for primary health care services to organizations that also do privately funded abortions. The theme of taxpayer conscience was not central in the debate on the historic uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of, of 2010, uh, for decades, uh, health care reform was a very high priority of the late Senator Edward Kennedy. The Affordable Care Act could, I think, more accurately be described as Kennedy Care, 
uh, than as Obamacare. Uh, Ted Kennedy and his awesome staff uh, led a process that included diverse healthcare providers, insurers, employers, labor unions, states, and advocates for many years leading up to the adoption of the Affordable Care Act. Um, the senator was instrumental in getting the federal waivers that allowed Massachusetts to launch its reform that served as the model for the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Kennedy, Kennedy Group and the Obama administration went into the conversation about health care reform assuming that it should not be the vehicle for either expanding or contracting abortion rights or abortion funding. Uh, for the most part, the pro-choice community agreed with that determination. Um, I disagreed, uh, arguing that the massive denial of essential medical services to women who depend on federal funding uh, is wrong. And if we're going to have health care for all, it should include women. Uh, most, it should include the most common surgical procedure in the United States. And it's a, a procedure that is extremely time sensitive and at the end of the day saves money and saves lives. We couldn't just ignore it. But I dissented mildly. Um, and I'm not politically influential. Um, and health care <laughs> insurance for all is a really important thing. And the pro-choice uh, community, in all honesty, has not built the political movement to challenge the federal restrictions on abortion funding. The anti-abortion forces were not willing to sign on to the proposition that health care reform should not be a vehicle for debating abortion. Many, many, many of those people are opposed to universal health care for reasons having nothing to do with abortion. Um, in general, pro-choice people care about a whole range of issues, while anti-choice people tend to be uh, more focused on particular hot-button issues, particularly abortion. In November 2009, the bishops and the Republicans rejected the assumption that health care reform should not be a vehicle for contracting access to abortion. Bart Stupak, Democrat of Missouri, uh, proposed that no low-income person receiving a federal subsidy should be allowed to uh, enroll in a plan that covered abortion. The Senate and the President defended their promise that, a, that uh, if you like the insurance you have, you'll be able to keep it under health care reform. But at the end of the day, the Senate needed the support of the root dog Democrats. Bill Nelson of um, Democrat of Nevada and Harry Reid uh, negotiated a Senate compromise that is the law today. Uh, basically what it says is that private insurers that cover abortion may not participate in the health care exchanges created under the Act unless they set up a separate plan to provide insurance coverage for abortion. Premiums must be collected in a separate check uh, and deposited into a second a separate account. As a practical matter, as a practical matter, no insurer is going to offer that plan. No one's going to buy that plan. Um, well, there was a lot of debate in the pro-choice community uh, between stupid, bad, Nelson, okay. Um, I don't think there's a dime of difference between the two. Uh, they're all, they're both the same. The idea that the conscience of the individual taxpayer uh, trumps the conscience of other taxpayers and publicly regarding concerns such as public health and budgets is a radical concept. It's inconsistent with American history and tradition. But before arguing that tax, the, the appeal to taxpayer conscience is wrong and dangerous, I want to place the, the role of conscience uh, in two larger contexts. The first context is about reproductive health care generally, 
And the second is that of conscience. Um, first, the lack of access to comprehensive uh, reproductive health care is not simply about money. 49% of the pregnancies in the United States are unintended. That's more than 3 million unintended pregnancies a year. The U.S. rate of unintended pregnancy is vastly higher than any other industrialized nation. U.S. women have access to a narrower range of contraception choice than women in other countries. Other countries do a much better job than we do at sex education, at integrating sexuality and contraception into primary medicine, and at providing primary care that includes reproductive health services. In 1970, because so many women lacked health insurance and or a regular source of medical care, Congress created Title X, a uh, family planning program. Former President uh, George H.W. Bush earned the nickname Rubbers uh, for his effective support of the Title X program in his first term in Congress. Title X clinics are a major source of primary health care in this country today. They don't provide abortion or referrals for abortion. Each year, more than 7 million women receive contraception from more than 8,000 subsidized family planning clinics. The Affordable Care Act requires insurers to cover preventative health care without deductibles or coinsurance. And this summer, the Re Institute of Medicine recommended that contraception be included in that list of preventative health services, and the administration accepted that recommendation. The context in relationship to access to abortion and abortion financing is quite different from the contraception context. Abortion rates are much higher in the United States than, again, any other developed country. Um, 22% uh, of all pregnancies end in abortion. The U.S. rates of abortion remain very high, even though women confront many obstacles in obtaining access to abortion, uh, not just the lack of funding. 97% uh, of counties outside of metropolitan areas uh, have no doctor willing to perform an abortion. 97%. That's a lot of counties. 82% uh, of the um, uh, most abortions, 95% uh, are performed in specialized clinics. 82% uh, of those clinics experience harassment, most often in the form of picketing, but 15% get bomb threats in the last year. Um, in most states, abortion providers must comply with a wide range of restrictive laws that have been adopted to discourage abortion. In the past eight months, states have adopted 61 new laws to restrict access to abortion, including mandatory ultrasounds, parental consent for incest victims, uh, <laughs> counseling for, from anti-abortion crisis counselors that are in no way medically qualified. Uh, my, one of my favorites is huge closets for janitorial supplies if you want to operate an abortion clinic. Uh, the midterm elections of 2010 increased the number of anti-choice legislators and governors, and the Supreme Court in 2007 shrunk the already weak constitutional protection of abortion choice. Just last week, uh, the House passed an amendment to the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, which normally requires hospitals that receive Medicare funds to provide emergency treatment. Uh, last week's amendment allows hospitals to refuse an emergency abortion, even if the woman is septic and hemorrhaging and her life is at stake. Safe legal abortion is inaccessible for many women. In New York City, where we have state-funded Medicaid coverage, uh, there's no parental notification, there are more abortion providers than any other area of the country, women still seek 
illegal abortions because they don't know that legal services are available. The medical director of a clinic in northern Manhattan reports that she sees at least one patient every week who's tried to end a pregnancy on her own, often with tragic results. Denying funding discourages abortion. About a quarter of the women denied Medicaid coverage for abortion carry the pregnancy to term. Uh, the U.S. has high, very high rates of infant mortality and morbidity. It seems likely that denying abortion to women who believe that they are not able to bring a child into the world contributes to that. Uh, women who are pregnant against their will have a more difficult pregnancy than women who want to be pregnant. Um, most poor women denied insurance for abortion raised the money to pay for it. Uh, often by foregoing essential food and shelter for themselves and their children. They have later abortions because they have to raise the money uh, that pose greater risk to their health and cost more. Uh, that, in brief, is a reproductive health context. Uh, I also want to put the new arguments about taxpayer conscience into a second con context, and that the context of conscientious belief. The recent laws invoke the conscience uh, of the taxpayer. Uh, decisions about reproduction also involve conscientious choices for women and for healthcare professionals. When the conscience of a woman, professionals, and taxpayers conflict, whose conscience should control. Uh, the conscientious beliefs of women are completely missing in the contemporary debate. Abortion is profoundly an issue of conscience for women confronted with unintended pregnancy. Most women and most faith regard abortion as a moral choice. Most Protestant faiths, including Presbyterians, Methodists, Episcopalians, United Church of Christ, and Unitarians, and there may be others, but at least those, um, ask that a woman of faith consider whether bringing a child into the world is consistent with her best understanding of God's plan for her life and the contributions that she might be able to make to God's work on earth. Um, it's not simply that faith allows women to pick willy-nilly. Uh, it's rather that faith requires her to make a responsible choice whether to bring a child into the world. Most Protestants do not regard the fetus or the embryo as a human being until viability. Um, other influential pro Protestants, the evangelicals, regard abortion as immoral. Uh, their vision of a good society places a high value on the idea that sex should always be open to the possibility of conception um, and that women should be dependent on men. Many also regard the fetus as a person from conception. Most Jewish theology does not regard the fetus as a human being until it's born. Uh, Jewish thinking puts the health of the woman at the center of the decision-making process about abortion. Reform, Reconstructionist, and conservative Judaism supports reproductive choice as a matter of conscience, while Orthodox Jews give less weight to the woman's conscience uh, and more weight to the health risks, medical health risks, physical health risks. Uh, many understandings of Islam support women's right to reproductive choice, while others disagree. Only the hierarchical Roman Catholic Church is definitive in teaching that the fetus is a human being from the moment of conception and that abortion is always morally wrong. But Catholics have abortion as often as anybody else. Um, uh, and there is a long Catholic tradition of uh, public tolerance uh, for diversity of moral views, even on fundamental issues, uh, not on abortion. Obviously, this is a highly simplified version of complex moral views. Uh, and many women are conscientious 
but not religious. Uh, still, the decision whether to bring a child into the world is a matter of deep conscientious belief for most women. Women's beliefs are completely missing from the current debate. Healthcare professionals also have legitimate claims of conscientious belief in relationship to abortion. The, influent, the initial federal approach to provider conscience was to assure governmental neutrality and to seek accommodation amongst conflicting conscientious beliefs. Doctors and hospitals should not be penalized because they provide abortions or because they refuse to provide abortions. Since 1973, the Federal Church Amendment has provided that receipt of federal funds does not require any individual to perform an abortion and also prohibits entities receiving federal funds from discriminating in employment in the extension of uh, in, in employment or in the extension of staff privileges because an individual has performed abortions or continues to do so. Hospitals were required to make reasonable accommodations for workers with conscientious belief supporting or opposing abortion. Similarly, the Civil Rights Restoration Act of 1988 mandated neutrality with respect to abortion conscience and the federal law mandated government neutrality with respect to matter of conscience and required accommodation of conflicting views. In recent decades, state laws protecting the conscience of healthcare providers have proliferated. They protect not simply healthcare professionals and providers, but also insurance companies, managed care organizations, corporations, pharmacists, uh, laws to protect provider conscience that extend beyond abortion to sterilization, contraception, emergency contraception, refusal to comply with a patient's request to remove or withhold a life-saving treatment. In some states, conscience clauses protect the right to decline to participate in, refer for, or give information about any health care service. So broad group protected from broad range of actions. These state laws typically provide unconditional immunity from civil, criminal, disciplinary, or adverse employment action. Two points should be underscored about the broad protection that most states have extended to the right to refuse medical treatment. First, the right to refusal carries no accompanying responsibility. Uh, principles of medical ethics, professional standards of care, enforced through tort liability in the event of injury, require that when a medical professional is unable or unwilling to provide a medical service that a patient needs and seeks, the professional has to provide an informed referral, specifically in relationship to abortion. Uh, American College of Obst Obst Obstetrics and Gynecology says where conscience implores a physician to deviate from standard practice, including abortion, sterilization, and provision of contraception, they must provide potential patients with accurate prior notice of their personal commitments. Physicians have the duty to refer patients in a timely manner to other providers. Uh, if they don't feel that they can in conscience provide the standard reproductive services, in resource poor areas, access to safe and legal reproductive services should be maintained. The state refusal clauses are flat in the face of the ethical principles of the AMA, ACOG, and professional standards of care. Uh, protection of conscience is no longer neutral. Only healthcare providers who refuse are protected, while providers who are willing to provide are not. Conscience clauses generate significant asymmetries in the resolution of conflicts between doctors and nurses uh, with the hospitals, clinics, and nursing homes where they practice. A professional who refuses care for reasons of conscience can't be disciplined and must be accommodated, while the doctor whose conscience requires that he respond to the patient's needs can be fired 
for following conscience. This asymmetry, penalizing women who seek abortions and the professionals who serve them, is not limited to accommodation of professional conscience or to funding. The general pattern of abortion exceptionalism places onerous restrictions on abortion providers. They are public, uh, subject to inspections, required to maintain elaborate record, to meet physical plant requirements that are not applicable to other providers. More than half the states uh, place unique requirements on legally effective informed consent for abortion, much more stringent than those required for anything else. Uh, most of the regulation of the medical profession is enforced by professional sanctions, such as disciplinary action by a licensing body or tort liability. Abortion regulations, by contrast, are backed by the threat of criminal penalties, including prison sentences for violation. The legitimacy of the claim of taxpayer consciousness must be considered in these contexts. These claims are narrowly focused on a particular subject, abortion. They're designed to protect only the conscience of one contested point of view. The conscientious taxpayer who opposes abortion is in conflict with the conscience of many women, uh, many medical professionals, and indeed many taxpayers. As a matter of democratic politics and public policy, we should be deeply skeptical of the claim of taxpayer conscience. Nobody likes to pay taxes. Uh, but, as Oliver Wendell Holmes observed, taxes are the price we pay for civilized society. The notion that taxpayers should not be expected to contribute to the programs they regard as immoral has some deep, noble, historic roots. Tax resistors for women's suffrage were unwilling to pay taxes to a government that didn't allow them to vote. Uh, generations of pacifist war resistors refused to be complicit in government spending on war or on particular wars. The Amish tried to refuse to pay social security tax because they regarded it as insurance and they did a better job of taking care of their own than they thought an insurance plan could. Uh, Gandhi used tax resistance as a tool to bring down the British coloni colonialism, and De David Henry Thoreau went to jail to protest the Mexican-American War and slavery. But all of these historic examples are quite different. First, all of these taxpayers, uh, objectors, appreciate that they had to explain the publicly regarding reasons behind their objection that just individual conscientious objection is not its own justification. Secondly, these taxpayers, um, well, some of these taxpayers, like Thoreau, were willing to go to jail. Uh, third, taxpayers with conscientious objections to tax and tax and taxes or compulsory military service typically seek a personal exemption uh, rather than to modify the public policy to which they object. Claims of taxpayer consciousness, uh, con conscience imply that the beliefs of others who disagree are not conscientious, are not moral. Such claims are politically divisive. The language of taxpayer conscience elevates ordinary politics into a politics of individual rights and does so inappropriately. Courts have uniformly rejected taxpayer claims that the First Amendment or any other form of uh, conscience protects the right to refuse to pay taxes. As a general matter, federal taxpayers can't challenge the constitutionality of federal funding programs. In 1923, a unanimous Supreme Court rejected the claim of a taxpayer who sought to challenge the federal government's authority to uh, make grants to reduce infant mortality. Uh, the plaintiff had suffered no injury that could uh, enable her to sue, the court said. 
The interest of the ta federal taxpayer is, according to the court, shared with millions of others, is comparatively minute and indeterminate. And the effect upon future taxation of any payment out of funds is too remote and fluctuating and uncertain. It's not clear that the taxpayer standing principles illuminate the legitimacy of federal legislation that relies on taxpayer conscience. Nonetheless, I think that the taxpayer standing cases affirm Holmes' insight that the injury we suffer as taxpayers, forced to contribute to public policy with which we disagree, does not count for much. Having failed in their effort to persuade Congress to deny federal funds to Planned Parenthood in 2011, the anti-abortion folks persuaded six states to defund Planned Parenthood. Uh, these state laws have now been enjoined by the lower federal courts in three states, Indiana, Kansas, and North Carolina. Uh, in Indiana, the Federal Centers for uh, Medical, Medicare and Medicaid Service disapproved the state law that excluded Planned Parenthood from Medicaid because it provides legal abortions financed with uh, private funds. The federal courts in these three states found that the anti-Planned Parenthood exclusions violated Medicaid's freedom of choice requirement that protects the rights of Medicaid eligible people to pick their providers and also violates the provisions protecting the rights of qualified providers to participate in the program. Uh, plaintiffs presented very strong evidence of harm if the laws went into effect, uh, turning away patients, laying off staff, and closing clinics. In North Carolina, the court also found that the targeted exclusion violates the, con the federal constitution there are two major obstacles to any constitutional challenge to targeted defunding of Planned Parenthood, Harris v. McRae and Russ v. Sullivan. In McRae, the court held that uh, Congress could exclude abortion from the otherwise comprehensive Medicaid program. Um, uh, and the plaintiffs argued that that exclusion, treating abortion dramatically differently, uh, violated equal protection, the court rejected the claim, and the McCray ruling uh, has held and has been extended to all forms of federal funding for abortion. The Supreme Court's not likely to reverse it. Uh, the North Carolina court distinguished McCray, noting that the Supreme Court ha had said a substantial constitutional question would arise if Congress had attempted to withhold all Medicaid benefits from an otherwise eligible woman based on her constitutionally protected activity. The North Carolina law, law according to the court, uh, does not simply limit funding for a particular project. Instead, it limits funding for a certain group of grantees, that is Planned Parenthood. In Russ v. Sullivan in 1991, the court upheld federal regulations that prohibit recipients of federal funds for family planning from providing counseling concerning abortion or making referrals for abortion. Uh, the regulations prohibited recipients of federal money from referring a woman, a pregnant woman, to an abortion provider, even upon specific request, even in circumstances where there was a medical need. Uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist, writing for the court, upheld the regulation on grounds that the government can decide what it wants to fund. Uh, but as in McRae, uh, the court said, Title X grantee can continue to perform abortions, provide abortion-related service, and engage in abortion advocacy. It's simply required to do those things separately with private money. Uh, the attempted federal legislation and the laws adapted in Indiana, Kansas, and North Carolina go further than that. In the name of taxpayer conscience, they penalize Planned Parenthood for providing abortion and abortion referrals in separate programs with separate private funding. Well, over the years, many states have have adopted these laws targeted at Planned Parenthood organizations 
and dozens of federal courts have rejected the targeted defunding of Planned Parenthood, generally on grounds that the laws violate the federal Medicaid requirements uh, and Title X. In conclusion, for now, the federal courts have rejected state efforts to deny Medicaid and family planning funds to Planned Parenthood. Um, still, it's difficult to be optimistic about the long-term success in the federal courts in these cases. In recent years, the Supreme Court has sharply restricted the situations in which patients and healthcare providers can challenge restrictions in federal health care programs. Uh, the court is now considering a case that would continue that trend and make it more difficult for people to uh, enforce the com promises that Congress makes in adopting the Medicaid program. Uh, the lower court decisions hearing these claims in the Planned Parenthood cl uh, cases and granting preliminary relief are part of a long to tradition of judicial involvement in enforcing the promises of the federal health care financing law. But that tradition is eroding. Ah, substantive constitutional protection for reproductive choice is even more fragile ah, than the right to go to court and enforce the requirements of the federal Medicaid program. Uh, if state and federal legislatures continue to adopt laws that disparage the physical, moral, and economic needs of women, I think the courts are unlikely to stop them. Still, I want to end on a more positive <laughs> note. <laughs> uh, uh, what we need is a popular political movement built on an understanding that control of reproduction is centrally important. Control of reproduction is essential to women's health, to their ability to be good mothers, to their ability to make contributions to a complex world, um, and to be true to their own conscience, and to be full citizens. In the years since Roe, women seeking abortion and health professionals who serve them have been silenced, have been marginalized by powerful voices that assert a monopoly on morality. As the restrictions expand uh, to touch a vast majority of the women, we must work to build a popular pro-choice politics that can respond. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Law is going to take some questions now, but before, I just want to Thank you. On behalf oh, thank of you. Thank wonderful. you. So much. Uh -huh. I'm going to do it now before we break and do it up after the So thank you. Questions? No funding for abortion, even if the woman is willing to pay, even if the doctor is willing to provide, it's no funding for abortion. So does that mean if she were to leave the reservation line, she doesn't Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it means that, yeah, it, of course, she can, leave, she can leave the reservation, just like the soldier in so Afghanistan can go AWOL and fly to Germany. She might get in trouble. <laughs> They, of course, they wouldn't take for it. Yeah.
skeptical about the legal. I mean, what I expect to see happen is he, uh, well, two state, two, fed, three federal courts have now struck down ultra sound design. What I, but what I expect to see happen in the court challenges to this restriction is that we'll win in the district court. I mean, when the Supreme Court decided Harris v. Clay, there had been literally dozens of federal district and circuit court cases uh, considering the exclusion of abortion from Medicaid, and we won every one of them. And then we got to the Supreme Court and they lost five four. Uh, that's what's going to happen to the probably the six three. Uh, but <laughs> uh, so I have no hope for the court. Thank you. Uh, it's probably important to litigate those things because. It's a forum in which you can have a debate about what's just. Uh, but at the end of the day, the Supreme Court's going to do it against us, I think. So that said, it's about politics and how do we deal with the political movement that is not just defending some kind of humiliating, um, you know, negative way. So I'd like to ask a couple of questions about the, the political movement, the political campaign. So it seems to me that many young people are seeking to address the lack of sex education, especially in the beginning and later. So when I teach my cohort in policy course and ask students to describe what sex education is to kids, it's a pretty
that it mandates neutrality, uh, that it protects conscience in a symmetrical way. Because it, for the last 20 years, it's all been about protecting the conscience of, of the refusers. Um, and I had some vague recollection that the church was neutral and protected conscience in, in a symmetrical way. And sure enough, but we've lost track of that. So it's, it's, it is not the case that having a public program means that you necessarily have to pick one thing or the other. You can build in respect for diversity. Secondly, what's happening now is moving, be the core of what's happening now is moving beyond uh, we can refuse to spend taxpayers' dollars on things we don't like to we're going to prevent you from spending your own dollars on things you don't like. You know, that excluding insurance companies from the exchanges, taxing, uh, denying tax-exempt status to employer contributions to insurance plans that include abortion. That's not libertarian. That's taking away the right of the employer to decide what they want in their insurance policy. some commentary, uh, but, I, but I think you're basically right that uh, I don't really have a theory. It's, it's interesting. It was, there was some press praising the administration. You know, I, honestly, I think it's the best thing the administration has done for women since they've been in. You know, it, it was a courageous thing to do in some ways. I don't have a theory. What you were just talking about before around the prohibiting use of private dollars mm -hmm. to pay for something that people want, in some ways it's the opposite of the argument that was used to take down the Indian Money Act. The idea that you know you can't tell me what to do. Right. Um, Yeah, definitely <laughs> that. <laughs> but beyond that, I have a question about the movement. I, I come from an organized Yeah, background. good. There was a movement in this country for reproductive rights. There was. And there's still remnants of this out there. All right. I mean, I know Massachusetts Now is still All doing right. their thing to some degree. National Now, and other organizations too. What are the barriers to, well, I guess, First, what created the circumstance that this movement dissipated? And then what are the barriers today to revamping? All right. Well, I, I think um, this is based on my experience working with local groups in the Hudson Valley uh, around, you know, so many hospitals are merging with Catholic hospitals that insist that they follow the Catholic directives on end-of-life choice and abortion, et cetera. Um, so I worked with a group Try to, what we we actually ha were quite successful in getting an arrangement where the hospitals merged, but the reproductive health services were preserved. Um, but in that political struggle, I was always struck by the fact that all the folks who would come out to the meetings and the picket lines and to get the churches signed up on our site, et cetera, were like in their 70s. Uh, they were like old, <laughs> and <laughs> obviously reproductive health was not on the top of their agenda, but <laughs> um, they were left over from the bad old days. They remembered when abortions were illegal, and they just had, a, and men too, um, men and women who remembered the bad old days and had a passion for the issue.
So in the since Ro, so our core problem is that we won in Roe v. Wade, and uh, I think. I, I, I think the thing that's new about this moment is that we're going much more after the educated middle class. That over the last 30 years, the people who have been denied all the restrictions on 48 hour waiting period, informed consent, et cetera, and so forth, it's not going to affect us. And any of us can jump through those hoops if we need an abortion. It affects uh, people who are young and poor and live in rural areas and are, are less educated and uh, have a family situation where it's hard for them to get away. And insofar as the anti-choice people have been able to put restrictions that are targeted at the vulnerable, then the elite people, the educated people, the people with resources, the people with voices, the people with political clout, they, there's not a big problem. If I need an abortion, you just, so you have to jump through a few hoops. But it's not, it's not like it was pre-Roe v. Wade. Though for lots of women, it is exactly what it was pre-Roe v. Wade. Pre-Roe v. Wade, I had a long list of illegal abortionists. Any woman I, who knew me was not going to have a pregnancy she didn't want to have because I'd sent her to an illegal abortionist. And so it costs more, and it's a little hassle, and it's illegal. But, ed <laughs> <laughs> but lots of things are illegal. But ed educated, uh, educated, informed women with money and connections have always gotten access to abortion. And that's kind of, we're moving back to that. But I'm hoping that as things, I'm not usually one of those people that says, oh, we have to let things get really, really bad so that people will rise up and change. But I think in this situation, that's our only source of hope, is that as it touches more and more people, people will say, no, this is not right, and, and, uh, and mobilize. is that once you get below the, uh, the top, there's a lot of diversity in the church and that especially Catholic health care providers are absolutely freaked out at the notion that the church would really start enforcing their, their uh, end-of-life choice directives require that you keep people on machines 
when the person says, turn it off. And that's like a battery. That's a crime. That's, you, you can't do that. And it puts those health care workers in a very uh, difficult situation. <laughs> um, so it's... I agree with that, but it just seems to me that the organized church, not the individual, right. here with this huge diversity of people right. who, tell, who, who are Catholics, right. um, but the organized church seems to have changed the way that people are dealing with I think that's right. I think it, it gotten much more aggressive, certainly at the Vatican level, certainly at the bishop's level, right. and, and then, and then it varies how far down it comes. Yeah. yeah. I think that th those kinds of arguments, I mean, I think part of the reason that the um, high cases and the 